Minnesota 29 of Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hey everyone, before I begin today, I want to thank our sponsors, CME Group, Trading Technologies, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. Now today I spoke with independent energy trader, Tracy Shuchart, and energy markets expert, Anas Alhaji. We began today's conversation by discussing the WAN denominated oil contract and the importance of shale crude quality. I asked Anas what the major forecasts are missing, and Tracy and I had a great chat on how she trades the inventories and other data points using fundamentals and technicals. Finally, Anas and Tracy taught us a few things about the API and EIA numbers, and they both gave us their thoughts on the upcoming JMMC meeting. As usual, thank you all for listening, and please enjoy this episode. Tracy and us, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Well, it's great to have the two of you on the show today. I'm really excited for this show today, not only because I get to speak to the both of you, but this is a new format that I'm trying out on Futures Radio Show. Uh, I wanted to have two guests on that both believe in technicals and fundamentals, but one that focused more on fundamentals and one that focuses more on technicals. So Anas, you primarily focus on the fundamentals but you also believe in technicals. And then Tracy, you and I have talked about this many a times on Futures Radio Show before. You primarily focus on the technicals, but you also watch the fundamentals. So in today's format, I have a few topics for you guys. I want to hear from Anas first. I want to have him give us uh, the fundamental outlook on, on the topic. And then we're going to have you come in, Tracy, and tell us whether or not you see that the fundamentals that Anas is talking about hitting the tape and if it's basically agreeing or disagreeing with the technicals or you don't see the fundamentals impacting the market at all. So the first topic I want to talk about is something that I've seen both of you recently discuss on Twitter, and it's this wand denominated oil contract. So Anas, kick us off today. What are your thoughts on this wand denominated oil contract? Okay, the main issue for any oil contract priced in non dollar is whether the oil will be priced in that currency. So, here is oil in China priced in yuan. This is different from just getting paid in yuan. These are two different things. My view is that oil is and will remain priced in US dollar. And what we see in China today is just the equivalent of that price in one. To make it clearer, for example, when Saddam Hussein in Iraq tried, supposedly there is this conspiracy theory going on that whatever happened in, in Iraq because he wanted to price oil in dollar. No, that was not the case. All he asked for is to get the revenues in euro. So the pricing in the world remained in dollar but he get the revenues in euro. What we see in China today is exactly the same. The revenues, in a sense, in yuan, but oil remained priced, priced in dollar. So that, this is really the main difference between what I believe, and I think Tracy believed too, and the others, is that we believe that it is just kind of using the exchange rate to get another currency, and that's it. Tracy? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I mean, there were a lot of um, things going on about how it was correlated. You know, it had a gold option in it and things like that. And it's simply not true. It's a, it's a physically delivered contract. There's not any gold related to it. You know, when they talk about the price of this yuan-denominated contract, 
they translate it into dollars anyway, else you have no reference of what it's priced as. So everybody's quoting it in dollars anyway, even though it's trading in yuan. So Tracy, has this had any impact on WTI? And if so, is, what have you been watching on this yuan denominated contract? My first initial thought was they were going to try and sink the oil price. And I ended up being right short term. I mean, you know, it was it was for a swing trade. And if you'll notice, the day that it opened, I was trying to look for technical areas where I could take a swing short. And so that's kind of how I, I used it. And, um, you know, if you noticed the day that it opened, we ticked up to that 66 area. Um, technically, it, you know, it worked. There was re resistance there. We um, you know, basically had a double top. And that's been my swing trade. May I add a couple so of points, left. Anthony, right. here? Absolutely. Uh, yes. The, the first one basically is what we are seeing right now is just by using the one in China, risk increased and the reason why risk increased because what you are adding to the oil contract is the risk of the exchange rates that everyone has to carry so risk is higher and then you are carrying the risk of all the changes in, in monetary and fiscal policies in china that are associated with it the second point is what we are talking about basically can be tested easily over time because all we get to do just look at the correlations between the prices in one and the correlation between other markers in the region, like Dubai and Oman, for example, and they look at WTI and at uh, Brent and see over time whether there is this long term correlation or not. If there is long term correlation, then again, it just kind of revenues in one. That's what it is. There is no pricing in one. Gotcha. Yeah. Anas, you made a great point. The risk increased with the exchange rates. Now, Tracy, I want to go back to you because I know that you watch the euro for when you're trading crude. Are you watching the one now when you're trading crude? So, I mean, I, you know, as far as, I mean, I don't watch, I don't watch the currency like USD, CNY. It's not a currency that I follow. I, I don't think this contract is going to fundamentally change the oil market as much. I think that it'll find its equilibrium and it'll be priced, you know, among the different grades. Cause you have to understand you have WTI Brent and this contract they're all different grades of crude. So I think it'll find its equilibrium. But but initially when it came out, you know, I knew that there were going to be, um, I, I thought they would try to sink it and with additional risk. So that's how I used that particular event to make a trade decision. It has changed the dynamic of how oil trades at night a little bit. You know, but that's, you know, it's, but it's, again, it's still new. So, you know, I'm still kind of keeping an eye out to see how much of an impact it's going to continue to have. No, yeah, that's a great point. I mean, looking at it at night, that's when I think it probably will have the most impact. You have U.S. markets closed, then you have you know, Chinese markets open. So, yeah, I right. think that's definitely something to keep an eye on. I want to move on to the next topic I wanted to talk about. And Anas, you tweet about shale crude quality. Could you please explain to us what that is and why it's important? Yes, uh, in a sense, uh, we can sum it up by saying crude quality matters. Shale, uh, shale oil is mostly light crude and condensates, uh, mostly above uh, 40 API, uh, this 40 degrees. Uh, we are talking about gravity here, but this is only one of the characteristics of light crude. Uh, it is, generally speaking, good for gasoline and some NGLs, but definitely not good for distillates. Based on the current forecasts of growth in uh, production of shale, and of course, some organizations are forecasting massive growth in shale in the coming years. There is not enough refining capacity to handle it. Uh, remember, in, in 2013 and 14, under the export ban, the crude export ban that we had in the United States, everyone was talking about that refining wall we are going to hit because all we are producing from shale is light crude and we don't have enough refining capacity. We were supposed to hit that in 2015, but the decline in prices at that time prevented the increase in the, that large increase in shale, and therefore we did not hit the wall. But then the ban lifted, and we started exporting it to other countries. Uh, U.S. refiners do not want to take any of it anymore, any growth, uh, and it's going to other places. And now those country by country basically are going to hit that refining wall. 
So at the end, what's going to happen is this will reduce demand for shale in the future and increase differentials. But people were, were the point that's missing from the discussion is that most people, especially when you talk to people from the oil companies, they say, well, don't worry about it because refiners are going to take care of it and they are going to invest in extra capacity and they can handle it. Well, no, most refiners have no interest in investing in additional capacity to handle light crude and condensates simply be because when they look at the future, most of the growth in oil demand is in the middle of the barrel, not in the top of the barrel. And shale basically fulfilled the top of the barrel. So why invest in adding capacity to handle light crude if the demand for gasoline is expected to decline while demand for middle distillates is going to increase substantially? The point here is, especially for those organizations who are forecasting massive growth in shale, shale production. It's illogical. It's totally illogical to forecast massive growth in production of light sweet crude, and of course, condensates added here, and at the same time, forecast a decline in gasoline consumption and larger growth in middle distillate consumption. It just does not add up, which means that the demand for shale oil in the future, in the coming years, is going to be limited, and therefore the growth, the promised growth, is not going to happen. And of course, that will have impact on prices at, and differentials and other things. Tracy, he said two things that I picked up uh, that I think are going to be important on the trading side. Correct me if I'm wrong. Demand and differentials. What are you seeing from what Anas said to have any, is any of that impacting the markets right now that you're seeing? And if not, what data points or, or what should we be looking for to when we think that this, that what he spoke about will have an impact on crude prices? Yeah, I mean, as far as that's concerned for right now, I think that's a little bit farther out than I personally trade. You know, that, that would be something that I would start looking at, that I would keep in the back of my mind for months ahead to see, because it's not really showing up in the market right now, you know, because we're exporting more. Um, China's still buying. So, you, you know, that that portion of it could be true, but it's for me, day or swing trading for right now and the time frames that, that I personally trade in, um, that, that's not going to show up yet. It, where it will make a market difference is probably in the crack spreads. And you'll start seeing, you know, uh, refining margins and things like that. So I think that's the area that, you know, I would be watching to see when that fundamental sort of was starting to occur to affect the market is I would be looking at, at the crack spreads. So something that you said that is something that I use when trading in the treasury markets, it's not really something that's impacting us right now, but if I see a headline, then all of a sudden it matters. You know, we as traders say this right. a lot. It doesn't matter until it matters. So right. what, so basically what we know, right, we know from what Anas is saying is that this matters, but we as traders right. look at the tape and say, well, maybe not right now. So what is a headline coming up that you would see that would be relatable to what Anas is talking about and say, okay, now all of a sudden this matters? Any headline regarding like refining margins or anything like that, especially uh, in Europe and the United States, uh, you know, Something like that would be what I would start looking for is when refining margins get way out of whack, that's kind of when you know um, there's an imbalance somewhere in the market as far as supply and demand is concerned. So take us to, to a moment where we would get that headline uh, and you would see that and you'd be like, hey, you know what, this is coming through my fundamental research. This is now something that I know is going to have an impact uh, most likely on the market, the price of the market where we are right now. Is that a headline you would just trade off of or would you have to go back, look at your charts and, and maybe uh, wait for a technical setup to confirm it? I would definitely have to wait for, for a technical setup to, to sort of confer, confirm that. Gotcha. Now, uh, Anas, in our last interview, you and I discussed forecasting a lot. We had, we had a lot, uh, you had a lot to say about this. And you have been talking about how things that major forecasts are missing. 
what are they missing right now? Uh, of course, they are missing several issues, but the main issues basically are Europe and energy efficiency. In Europe, uh, all those major uh, organizations and other oil companies and banks basically have missed the growth in oil consumption in Europe in the last four years. Every month and every quarter, they missed it. We have massive growth, uh, of course, relative massive growth in Europe. Uh, they've written uh, uh, demand for oil in Europe off, and that was a big mistake because they understood what happened in Europe during the financial and economic crisis before that. Um, so they've been underestimating Europe. They've been revising uh, estimates for oil consumption in Europe every quarter. They've been revising it, and every month, and... The problem is, if you look at their future forecasts, they are still match the the era before the revisions, which means they are they are still forecasting a decline in oil demand in Europe, while we have four years of, in, of continuous increase in oil demand in Europe, and that's a big problem. We are talking here about over twenty five year period. Probably we are talking about. Uh, uh, four to five million barrels a day. So that's significant. The other issue is when you look at the way they calculated future demand, they said, okay, here is the normal case for demand. And they plot it for the next 25 years. And then they say, okay, we have uh, electric vehicles. Is, that's going to lower demand by this much. And then energy efficiency is going to de lower demand by this much. And that's where the problem is. Some organizations are forecasting a decline of 12 million barrels a day within 25 years because of, of, of not energy efficiency. That's my mistake. Sorry. I'm talking about fuel economy. That's only the, the engines. And ha this has nothing to do with, with electric vehicles. That cannot be. And the reason why, because as of today, the technology has peaked, unless we have new technology like the one around Saudi Aramco is talking about. Uh, uh, Aside from that, we have a serious problem because uh, the technology has peaked and the only way we we're trying to improve mileage is by using lighter materials in building cars on one hand and using smaller cars. But that will have limit too because you, uh, on lighter materials, you have to worry about safety. And in terms of smaller cars, they are limited by our size. They cannot go smaller than our size. So in a sense, we are almost peaked on that. So where that decline of 12 million is going to happen, even even eight, even four, it's not going to happen. And therefore, I think we they are underestimating demand by a large margin. And for the future, it's going to be way higher. We don't have enough investment right now to match that demand. And therefore, in the future, we are heading straight to an, an energy crisis. Hey, everyone, I hope you're enjoying the show so far. But I want to pause and thank one of our sponsors. Trading Technologies. I started using TT in the year 2000, and I love it. It is by far the best trading platform I have ever used, and I've tried a lot of them. With TT, you can trade the global markets from virtually anywhere in the world. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. I highly suggest you go try out TT, especially because you can try it for free. Just go to tryttnow.com and set up your account. So, Tracy, this is very interesting to me because when Ana says that they've been underestimating Europe for the past four years, that tells me that there has been reports or things coming out to where their mistake in the forecasts have to have had price impacts. Have you been noticing that? And has there been a trade off of that to where you've seen consistently them, them, them underestimating this? And then all of a sudden, boom, it, it reflects it in, in the I price. Mean, I mean, I, I personally haven't noticed that when the reports come out you know there's always there's a trade-off of that but i mean as far as i mean just to be honest um i i don't really i don't know that much about the mis forecasting um so it doesn't really factor into again how i trade or my my time frame understood but when we go sense. back to where there's <laughs> inefficiencies in forecasting um, are, are there any data points that you're looking at 
where some of your fundamental research is coming in, you're like, wow, this number is way off. And all of a sudden now that it's going to have a major impact on the technicals. So are you going to jump on a forecast after the news comes out or does it have to be something that sets up technically with the missed forecast and maybe a price opportunity comes in for you to be able to trade it? Yeah, I mean, usually when, you know, because there's a, a lot of times there's a difference between, you know, the API and, and the EIA report. So you kind of go into it knowing what the market is expecting for whatever reason they still like, trust this API report. Uh, but, I mean, initially for me, if you if you notice, you know, trading, usually the number will come out and you'll get a reaction. But that's the opposite reaction that the market will have. So usually that gives me enough time to go into the report and see look deeper into the report what you know what you know the big boys what bigger traders are looking at and it's not just solely the numbers that come out you know cushing gasoline uh crude distillates but you know they're also looking at production numbers they're looking at imports they're looking at exports so you just generally the market will move and i get enough time to be able to I mean, you have to be quick, but I get enough time to be able to look through the report and go, oh, okay, I know what kind of how the market's going to react to this. And then I flip to my charts really fast to see, you know, do I see a technical level on my chart where I think that, you know, this move may turn around? So, I mean, it, as far as reports are concerned, that that's typically how I would use a report. You kind of got to be fast, though. Yeah. So basically, there's so much in that report. There's no way you're going to sit there and dissect what's in that report. You look at the report as a whole, and if it misses or it's right in line, you still look at the reaction, the technicals. Right. Exactly. You know, and I and I go and look at you know a few deeper things, not just the numbers, because you know the market doesn't. You know, the bigger players in this market, you know, are looking at imports, exports, production, things like that. That don't initially come out to the public, you know, you just get those four numbers. So, you know, I make it a point to go and look at sort of the bigger picture Gotcha. of the entire report. And if there's something that's a huge miss, you know, if, you know, imports are a huge miss or, you know, I know that, you know, those kind of things you kind of want to know and then take that information and stick it on your chart and look for, you know, the levels where, you know, I think the market is likely to react off of. Anthony, gotcha. may I make a little contribution to this here? Sure. Uh, in a sense, the bottom line of what she's saying basically is, and I'm going to just rephrase it in a different, completely different way. Most of the impact of these things basically are already being priced in simply because of the inventory numbers that we get way before we get the numbers for demand. Okay. Right. So they are already exactly. embedded in because we get the inventory numbers, for example, in the U.S. on on weekly basis. We get the export, we get the import, etc. So you see more price reaction to those, but that's really reflect, in a sense, a consumption number for the past that's going to appear two months later. Okay, I want to go back to something else that Tracy had said and, and see what you think about this. And uh, she she said for some reason the market continues to to believe this API number. And I've had this talk with several people on the show before, API versus EIA. Talk to us a little bit about why sometimes they could be so different. Well, the, the issue is, yes, they are so different. But when you try to judge them, let's say if we got to take both to court in a sense and, and try to see who is more credible, uh, there is no way you will know. There is no independent auditor to know who is more accurate. So in a sense, whatever you do, it really doesn't matter. If you believe the IA and you trade, most traders basically take the uh, EIA number, then that's what it is. Uh, if all be people basically believe that uh, today is uh, uh, Saturday, and it, is, it becomes Saturday to them, uh, regardless of the facts. Uh, so the issue is, uh, regardless of those differences, uh, it is very clear that most people believe the EIA number because the collection of data is mandatory. And that's the only reason why most people believe in it. But if you really want to judge which one is more accurate, in a sense, just like by court standards, we don't know. <laughs> wow. I mean, so basically the market's just moving off of these numbers, but yet we really don't know how real they are. Is that accurate? Correct. 
I mean, I think what's difficult, I just want to add is like, it's because, you know, I mean, at the end of the month, what you'll see is API and EIA are in line. So generally at the end of the month, they all, they both are end up with relatively the same numbers. And then, you know, you also have monthly reports that differ from the weekly reports in EIA. So there's a lot going on, but, you know, the algos and, um, you know, the, the market makers, you know, they're going to move the market. It's an opportunity. Yeah. So final question I have for today is this JMMC meeting coming up on April 19th. Now, some of the talk is about formalizing the cooperation with Russia. Other talk is that we will see a change in the five-year average metric to measure inventories in OECD because some say it's no longer useful. Let, let's start with Russia. And then also, uh, Anas, if you could explain to us why measuring these inventories in OECD is no longer useful. Okay, so we have two two different points. I think the Russia issue may not be related directly to GGMC, uh, GMMC uh, uh, business, uh, but generally speaking, we heard a lot about it in the news. Now, theoretically speaking, they need, I'm talking about OPEC, Saudi Arabia, Russia, they need to establish a framework for cooperation that they can uh, rely on every time they need to work together. In the absence of such framework, uh, they need to start every round of negotiations from scratch. Uh, starting uh, such negotiations every time they need to cooperate is costly, uh, as you know, in terms of time and money. I mean, you're talking about ministers and private jets and fancy hotels and et cetera, et cetera. So it, it really costs a lot of money. Uh, so creating a, firm, uh, a framework basically uh, saves uh, time and money for all involved. Uh, in addition, uh, with a framework in place, they can react to market surprises and political events quickly because there are no major negotiations to go through because the framework is already there. So which might benefit everyone, uh, including consuming countries. Also, uh, their cooperation uh, may not focus only on, on, on production cut and oil. It could expand to more than production cut. Within the oil business, it could focus on technical expertise and cooperation, etc. Uh, probably investment. And it might expand to energy cooperation, like what we are seeing with Saudi Arabia and Russia right now. We are talking about uh, LNG. We are talking about major uh, uh, energy projects. We are talking about Russians probably investing in the IPO around uh, in the IPO of Aramco, whether within Saudi Arabia or outside Saudi Arabia. So, in a sense, the framework looks really a natural result to all this cooperation we've seen for over a year now. Tracy, is there anything that uh, Anas is talking about that you're seeing impacting the tape? And also, with this meeting coming up, how big of a day is that for you as a day trader? And is that, is that going to have a major impact on pricing that day? Well, I mean, it really depends. I mean, everybody, they've already been talking about how they're, you know, going to cooperate. They need to, they need to extend cuts, you know, so what traders are going to be looking for um, on that day is what is the rec recommendation? Are they going to recommend another six months, another year, another five years, how long? So, you know, that, those are the kind of things you want to look at you know, in this particular meeting is, uh, and the past meetings is, you know, how long are, what is the duration that they're going to be looking at? Because if it's less than traders think, then the market's going to react unfavorably. If it's more, then the market probably will react favorably, but not by a whole lot because it's already the expectation. Gotcha. So going into it, you are doing the fundamental homework as to what the outcomes may be. Right. And so, I mean, you don't really, you know, I mean, the, the technicals will probably, you know, I always say technicals, you know, the chart tells you something and then a fundamental reason comes up, right, to kind of support a technical move. So, I mean, I'm still looking at, you know, my levels and, and things like that and looking at for certain areas. And, you know, I probably, you know, I would probably wait until the announcement to actually get into a trade because the unforeseen can happen and... You know, I, I don't want to get stuck. 
So, you know, that day, you know, I, you know, and, and it comes really early. So, you know, I probably would, unless I'm in a swing trade, I would not be day trading it until the announcement came out. How important are fundamentals in your trading? Um, I think for longer term trades that, you know, my swing trades, they factor in a lot more. If I'm day trading, then I'm just looking at intraday levels and where the market's going to react off of them. And it doesn't really factor into, say, my day trading, except for maybe obviously inventory days and things like that. Um, for swing trades, I absolutely factor fundamentals in, you know, as well as technical. Anas, we heard a lot from you today on fundamentals. How important are technical analysis in your trading? I think what she said is absolutely correct. I mean, on daily basis and within uh, like time of hours within the day, uh, really fundamentals do not play a, a big role here. Although indirectly, probably whatever people are trading on the trend is affected by the fundamentals that affected the market yes. the days before. But in the long term, no, I mean, no one can ignore fundamentals in the long term. I mean, we already talked about the forecast and what could be right and what could be wrong, etc. These are big factors in affecting the, the future trend in the long term. Right. Excellent insight today, guys. We'll go back to Tracy. Tracy, where can people find you on Twitter and give us a website to check out? So um, I'm on Twitter at ShyGirl and my website is ShyGirl.com. Anas, where can people find you on Twitter and a website, please? Uh, at Anas Alhaji, my first name, my last name, and my website is Anas Alhaji, my first name, last name dot com. Anas Alhaji, A N A S A L H A J J I dot com. You guys know where I stand. You absolutely have to follow both of them. Definitely tops of my book when it comes to energy markets. Tracy and Anas, thank you so much for coming on Futures Radio Show again. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you both. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit futuresradioshow.com and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.